Welcome to the latest episode of the Reviews series, and in this installment, I will dive into a major historical oversight in a video from Nalegia on Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. Their video, Why Did the Protestant Reformation Happen?, covers the history in the 1500s, which overlooks a critical series of events from over a century earlier that Luther acknowledged. I was not the only history buff to notice this glaring omission, as many other viewers also mentioned the unfortunate exclusion in the comments. Let's watch this clip from the video to see where they place the emphasis on the Reformation that omits the preceding history. While many view the start of the Protestant Reformation as having been in 1517 following the publication of Martin Luther's theses, the actual date of its beginning is somewhat unclear. There were essentially three main Reformation movements, one in Germany, one in England, and one in Switzerland, with all of them occurring around the same time in the 16th century. Though the three main movements noted in the video did occur, they owe a debt to the Bohemians, particularly to Jan Hus and Jerome of Prague. I will skip a lot of the related context of these two men in the interests of time, or this video would be an hour long, and the details are in my book, if I ever get it finished. The overlapping similarities between Hus and Luther are fascinating, given the impact each had in much the same way. Both men challenged the selling of indulgences, both translated Bibles into their local languages, with the result being the crystallization of the Czech and German languages, and both men faced the wrath of the Catholic Church. Over 100 years before Luther drafted his 95 Theses, in May 1412, a papal legate arrived in Prague setting up donation boxes for indulgences to fund a crusade against the King of Naples, who was supporting a rival pope, the details of which are tangential to this summary. For those not familiar with indulgences, think of it as a get-out-of-jail-free card with an express ticket to heaven, or at least a shortened time in purgatory. This was simply a scam which the pious Hus could not keep quiet about. Forgiveness was based on repentance, not a cash transaction, and Hus considered indulgences repellent and at odds with the spirit of the church and scripture. Hus held a fiery disputation in June 1412, with arguments challenging the church's intrusion into secular affairs by stating that only temporal powers could fight a war, and that it was never acceptable for the church to do so. Hus stated, If the pope wishes to overcome his enemies, let him pray for them as Christ did. Jerome of Prague's own tirade at the disputation earned him an ovation. A few days later, Jerome and others from the university held a rally and the protesters let it be known their support lay with Hus, not with the adulterers and Simonists in the church hierarchy. Three working class men who shouted down the indulgences in a coordinated campaign across three separate churches were subsequently beheaded for their impudence becoming martyrs to the Bohemian people and further inflaming anti-church sentiments. Predictably, the opponents of Hus lost no time in letting Pope John XXIII know that this troublemaker, who had been excommunicated two years earlier, was not only still preaching, but opposing the sale of papal indulgences. John reaffirmed the excommunication, ordering that it be read out in all the churches of the city and let it be known that he would not be unhappy if Hus were to be arrested and delivered to the archbishop by people loyal to the papacy. With Hus now squarely in the papal crosshairs, some of his supporters defected, including one of his earlier teachers and friend who would lead the coming assault against Hus. King Wenceslas IV, a supporter and protector of Hus, requested he leave Prague voluntarily, which he did in December 1412. Similar to Luther writing the German Bible while in refuge at Wartburg Castle in Thuringia, it was during this period of exile that Hus made one of his most impactful contributions. A Bible in a language the people understood was an essential component of any reform. Hus revised an anonymous 14th century Bohemian translation which, just as Luther's German Bible contributed to the solidification of the modern German language, the Bohemian Bible influenced the setting of the Czech language. Hus also used this time to put his thoughts on paper, writings which caused his influence and support among the Bohemians to grow even stronger. 
Hus agreed with the literal transubstantiation of the communion bread as decreed by Pope Innocent III at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, and never challenged it in any of his writings. Yet, this was one of the principal charges laid against him, a charge which he staunchly protested at his trial. When given the chance to recant something which he never claimed, he refused, as it would turn him into a liar, to ask forgiveness for the heretical charge of which I know nothing, and concerning which witnesses have declared things which it never entered my head to say, especially that after consecration, the bread still remained. Hus had two core principles that were the backbone of his entire ethic throughout his life. One, scripture is the only authority, and two, it is the Christian faithful, not the church hierarchy, who make up the true church. In this regard, Hus laid the preliminary groundwork for Luther and the Protestant Reformation. Indeed, Luther credits Hus with being the one who led the way, without Luther even being aware of him originally. Eventually, Hus was summoned by the Pope to a council in the city of Constance, Constance in modern Germany by the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund, brother of the King of Bohemia, Wenceslas IV. Kunz writes, It was foolish for Hus to go to the council, as he himself foreshadowed he would not come back to Prague. Because of this realization, some speculate perhaps Hus had a desire to be martyred for his cause. Skipping over the details of the trial at Constance, we go straight to his martyrdom. Hus was given one last chance to recant while tied to the stake, and replied, God is my witness that I have never taught nor preached those things which have been falsely ascribed to me, and the chief aim of all my preaching, writing, and acts was that I might save men from sin. And today I am willing and glad to die for that truth of the gospel which I have taught, written, and preached. On July 6, 1415, the foul deed was done, and his ashes were collected and thrown into the river to prevent his remains from becoming a relic of veneration. On May 30th, 1416, Jerome of Prague was equally unyielding to his captors, and rather prophetic in predicting the events that would unfold, stating, You have resolved to condemn me maliciously and unjustly, without having convicted me of any crime, but after my death I will leave a sting in your conscience and a worm that shall never die. I make my appeal from hence to the sovereign judge of all the earth, in whose presence you shall appear to answer me a hundred years hence. As Jerome predicted, the deaths of the two men did leave a sting a hundred years later, and that reckoning did indeed occur with Luther. However, prior to the European-wide Reformation that started in Germany was the Bohemian or Hussite Reformation that could have spread if not for several mitigating factors. The Church sure of its might to intimidate any would-be reformers into thinking twice, but instead of silencing dissent, it created a powerful martyr. Hus became the catalyst for all the Bohemian discontent with the Catholic Church, around which a large portion of the populace rallied. McCulloch notes that the Bohemian noble classes resented the Church hierarchy for its at attempts to dictate the internal secular matters in their country, and as such, Hus became an important figure in a national identity. Starting with the first defenestration of Prague in 1419, the Hussites, as his followers had become known, threw 13 loyal Catholic city administrators from the windows of the town hall after the Catholics had pelted a passing procession of Hussites with stones. Afterwards, there ensued 14 years of armed conflict, the Hussite Wars from 1420 to 34, in which the reformers defeated all five papal crusades sent against them. The Bohemian Reformation was factionalized between the Catholic-leaning moderate Utraquists and the hardcore reformers from the city of Tabor, known as the Taborites. Scholars speculate that it was this infighting that helped prevent the Bohemian Reformation from spreading throughout Europe. The Bohemian Reformation continued for two more centuries, and sparked the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 48. Following the Peace of Westphalia and invoking the doctrine of whose realm, his religion, the Habsburg king forced the Hussites to convert to Catholicism. McCulloch highlights several intriguing points about the Hussites, such as their church having no archbishops and consequently power devolved to the local nobility and city leaders, 
just as happened in the Reformation with decentralized Protestant churches. Also, the Hussites used the local Czech language in their services. Consequently, McCulloch notes that this was the first instance of a church of the Latin Rite independent of Rome, though a few isolated Bohemian regions remained loyal to the papacy, and it was only then that the term Roman Catholic could appropriately be applied to those enclaves. Almost 200 years later, another renegade Catholic priest was burnt at the stake in Rome for challenging church doctrine, Giordano Bruno. In 1889, a statue of Bruno was erected in the square where he was brutally executed, and around the pedestal are medallions to other martyrs of church intolerance, including Hus and the man who influenced much of his thinking, John Wycliffe. If you like my content, please like and subscribe to get notified of new videos. Please also consider supporting my work by becoming a Patreon sponsor. You can also find me on the following platforms.